The Foundations of Democracy by Frank Lawrence Owsley First published in Who Owns America? A New Declaration of Independence Edited by Herbert Agar and Alan Tate First published in 1936 Neither Congress, President, nor Supreme Court knows at this moment what is the Constitution of the United States, and it can hardly be proved that the remaining 130 million inhabitants of the United States possess any greater certainty about their Constitution than the three departments of the federal government which are sworn to uphold, maintain, and defend it. We are indeed in a constitutional fog, which has constantly grown thicker since the original document was presented to the country for ratification in 1787. Let me point out a few of the leading factors which have caused the people and their organs of government to become thus enveloped. It will be recalled that the convention which drew up the federal constitution in 1787 was, in essence, a revolutionary secessionist body. Its actions were in violation of state instructions, and the Articles of Confederation, which at the time were the Constitution of the United States. It performed its work in secret, and the document which it presented to the country in 1787, while it contained many fine principles of government, was essentially reactionary and undemocratic. The president was to be chosen by uninstructed electors, who in turn were to be chosen either by a suffrage based upon property qualifications or by state legislatures based upon a similar suffrage. The federal Senate was to be elected by these same legislatures, which usually held office, as today in many states, by the approbation of the county court or some other local political hierarchy, which was in practice self-perpetuating. The federal judiciary was to be chosen by the president with the consent of the Senate. The social philosophy of the Constitution was in keeping with its undemocratic mechanism. In short, the original Constitution was so contrived as to remove the federal government as far as possible from the sound of vox populi, and to place it in the hands of the few men of wealth. The vote upon this document could scarcely be called a plebiscite. Out of a population of four million or more, only about 165,000 voted on the state ratification conventions. Cajolery, trickery, and bribery were used to obtain ratification, and even so the margin in favor of ratification was only a few thousand. A constitution obtained by such methods and one which repudiated many of the fundamental principles for which the American Revolution had been fought only a few years before, could not be regarded by its contemporaries, or by a well-informed, intelligent person today, as sacrosanct, or a falling within the same category as the Ten Commandments. The impending dissolution of the American state, and reconquest by England, brought many liberal leaders, like James Madison, to support such a constitution. But even so, and despite the doubtful methods used to obtain ratification, the friends of the constitution would have failed had they not pledged the immediate incorporation into the constitution of the first ten amendments, which contain, to a great extent, the Bill of Rights, or the Rights of Man, for which the intellectual leaders of the American Revolution had contended and for which the common man had thought the war was fought. But the incorporation of the rights of man within a document reactionary in its philosophy of human society, as well as in its mechanism, could only thicken the fog which had already been raised. On the face of it, it appears to be an attempt to fuse in one short charter the philosophy of plutocracy and that of democracy, which was the impossible proverbial mixture of oil and water. In reality, it was the hopes of the old revolutionary leaders, soon to be called Jeffersonians, that the Bill of Rights would, by mere force of principle, correct 
the undemocratic features of the main body of the Constitution. Tacked on at the end and forming no organic part of the whole, the Bill of Rights was a liberal postscript added to an illiberal document. Fortunately for the plutocratic philosophy, that government is in essence the executive committee of great wealth. The Federalists, under the leadership of Alexander Hamilton, secured control of the executive branch of the government for 12 years, and the legislative during most of this time. But most fortunate of all, the Federalists, for 40 years, held possession of the judiciary, which arrogated to itself the power to declare laws of Congress unconstitutional, and in general to declare the law and the Constitution. For a brief period, under Justice Taney, the Jeffersonians gained control of the court. With the Civil War, the court came again under the control of the jurists who professed the Hamiltonian philosophy. After the Civil War, during so-called Reconstruction, the Federalists, now bearing the Jeffersonian name Republican, obtained two amendments, the 14th and the 15th, which were intended to change, and did change to a certain extent, the fundamental nature of the original Constitution. Now, all the historians of Reconstruction, except three Negro writers and one carpetbag ex-governor, agree that these two amendments were incorporated into the federal constitution by open fraud and violence supported by federal troops in the South, and congressional legislation, which even the Federalist Supreme Court would have thrown out had they not been intimidated by the radical leaders. Regardless of what may be thought of the desirability of such amendments, and that irrelevant question is not to be raised here, No self-respecting, well-informed American can look with reverence upon this portion of the federal document. But I wish to call attention, in passing, to the fact that it is the 14th Amendment which corporate wealth holds, next to the Jeffersonian Fifth Amendment, most sacred and most dear. Among other things, the 14th Amendment guarantees that the states can deprive no person of life, liberty, and property without due process of law, while the Fifth Amendment prohibits the federal government from depriving any person of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. By giving a corporation the status of a person, the Federalist judiciary has caused these colossal bodies of organized wealth to become the undefeated champions of personal liberty. The irony of these two amendments is withering. One was honorably secured by the Jeffersonians as safeguards for the liberty of the white man. The other, violently and corruptly secured by the Republicans, ostensibly in behalf of the liberty of the black man, both, like other Jeffersonian amendments on behalf of human liberty, have been erected by the Supreme Court not into bulwarks of human freedom, but into impregnable fortresses of corporate wealth. I have pointed out, thus far, various factors which have obscured the meaning of the original federal constitution and the Jeffersonian amendments, and which deprive that document of any claim to sacredness. The unconstitutional procedure of the Convention of 1787, the secrecy of its operations, the trickery and fraud used in the adoption of the constitution in 1787 through 1789, and in the adoption of the Reconstruction Amendments, the packing of the judiciary with Federalists when Jefferson was elected, the doubtful assumption of power by the Supreme Court to declare a federal law unconstitutional, and above all, the interpretation rendered the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. Another factor of paramount importance in darkening the glass through which we view the Constitution is or was, the sectional interpretation of the original document. One has only to remember New England's threats of secession during the Jeffersonian Embargo, or the War of 1812, or even at the annexation of Texas, or the southern threat of secession in the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions, the nullification movement, 
and the final secession in 1860, all centering in the meaning of the Constitution, in order to see that sectional interpretation was a major factor up until 1865 in creating doubt as to the meaning of the Constitution. I wish to comment further upon the role of the Supreme Court in befogging the meaning of the original Constitution and the amendments. Under the Hamiltonian philosophy that government is run for and by the rich, the Supreme Judiciary has stretched the Constitution of 1787 and the amendments in many different directions. Meanings have been read between the lines, into the lines, and beyond the lines. Lines have been added, subtracted, divided, and multiplied to fit the exigencies of the occasion and to benefit great wealth and destroy small wealth. One reads many of these decisions and looks about himself in vain for a familiar constitutional landmark. The Constitution, he feels, has been made to serve God and mammon, human liberty and human bondage. The Supreme Court has rendered hundreds of decisions which have defined the Constitution in all its aspects. Yet, despite the fact that this high court has usually been in the hands of jurists who are disciples of Hamilton, the hundreds of decisions which it has rendered are consistent chiefly in this one principle, excessive amiability towards those who possess great wealth and great indifference towards those who own nothing or small private properties. Outside of this excessive amiability to great wealth, the decisions of the Supreme Court, which cover about 20,000 pages and over 290 volumes, are confusion and contradiction, piled upon confusion and contradiction. Here we behold a constitutional Tower of Babel. Yet these 20,000 pages of decisions, rather than the document printed in the backs of our textbooks, are the working constitution of the United States. It is out of this welter of decisions which the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the federal government select the precedents on which they estimate the constitutionality of a bill or law. It is possible, of course, to go back to the original constitution itself and ignore the principle of stare decisis, but it is too much to expect of our jurists the Supreme Court have determined and will determine the constitutionality of a measure in accordance with their social and political philosophy, for they will have little difficulty in finding precedents to support their positions. The personnel of the great judiciary determines everything. In view of this, I am strongly tempted to assert that the Constitution of the United States is not the original document adopted in 1789 or the 20,000 pages of decisions but the Supreme Court itself. Such an assertion would be equivalent to saying that we are living under a judicial despotism. This perennial uncertainty as to what is our Constitution has been one of the most dangerous and disruptive forces in our history, and now that the economic, social, and political systems of the world are in chaos, such uncertainty adds to the uneasiness among all classes. While the Hamiltonians have the court today and are rejoicing that the Constitution has been saved, people are asking, what Constitution? Tomorrow, the Jeffersonians may control the court and save still another Constitution. But eventually, the fascists or communists may gain control of the court. And what Constitution will they save? It seems impossible to escape the conclusion that we need a new Constitution which will reconstruct the federal government from center to circumference. Such a reconstruction must take into consideration the realities of American life, past and present, and one of the greatest realities is sectionalism or regionalism, and above all it must be based upon the eternal verity that while man must eat, he does not live by bread alone. This is an excerpt of Owsley's essay. If you enjoy my audio recordings, I encourage you to investigate my Buy Me a Coffee link, which you can find on my YouTube page. Through my Buy Me a Coffee link, you can support me taking more time to make more recordings.
and I appreciate your support.